Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. The ocean is an unpredictable place. Unfortunately, it is also integral to the global supply chain, with thousands of ships traversing various waterways at any given time. When things go wrong, ships can end up stranded, capsized, or at the bottom of the sea. To reclaim their property, companies need to launch massive salvage operations. Though a wide range of methods are used, most modern salvage attempts include specialized ships and equipment, including crane barges, underwater cutting tools, and remotely operated vehicles. Using this highly specialized equipment and a deep understanding of the ocean, salvage companies work to recover valuable cargo, mitigate environmental risks, and, in some cases, refloat or repair damaged vessels. The largest shipwreck salvage operation in history took place in the early 2022. The subject was the MV Golden Ray, a 660-foot roll-on, roll-off cargo ship designed to carry up to 7,400 automobiles. In September 2019, the Golden Ray was making its way from the port of Brunswick, Georgia, with around 4,300 vehicles in its hold. It eventually caught fire and completely capsized just a few hundred feet offshore. The Golden Ray had a crew complement of around 23, but there was also a state-ordered harbor pilot on board, providing navigational instructions. Though 19 crew members were rescued immediately, the fire forced rescue operations to be put on hold for 24 hours. At this point, an MH-65 Dolphin air crew from a Coast Guard station in Savannah, Georgia, was able to extract the remaining crew members from the vessel, which was not resting on its side. We'll, uh, we'll come. Actually, I'll wait till they're up in here before moving. I don't go swinging in. And bring a swimmer survivor inside the cabin. The moment that we got the call for the Golden Ray, I was actually on duty. We heard that 25 people were in the water and that was pretty much the only information that we had. The wreck of the Golden Ray raised a lot of concerns beyond the presence of a 600-foot boat off the coast of southern Georgia. There were also concerns over the potential for oil and fuel leaks, as well as the presence of hazardous cargo, including vehicles with gasoline and other chemicals on board. Eventually, it was decided that the entire boat needed to be removed as soon as possible. T&T Salvage was called in to handle the job, which involved using a special floating crane equipped with a cutting chain to slide the vessel into eight sections, each of which would weigh between 2,700 and 4,100 tons. Each section was then transferred onto heavy barges for transfer to the shore, where they would be further disassembled. In order to contain any potential environmental damage, 
TNT constructed an underwater wall of shipping containers around both the wreck and the salvage operation, which ended up taking a full year to complete. While the size of the Golden Ray complicated the salvage operation significantly, at least the ship was on the surface. The same can't be said about a 423-foot-long oil tanker named the Coimbra, which was torpedoed by a German U-boat and sank off the coast of Long Island in 1942. The Coimbra sank to a depth of 180 feet, along with 476,000 gallons of oil. In 2019, concerns over the potential leakage of this material forced a salvage operation. Organized by the U.S., Coast Guard, and New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, this began by having divers go down to the wreck to install pumping systems to remove the oil. One of the more famous ship salvage operations in the U.S. was of an iconic warship, the CSS Georgia. It was an ironclad gunboat built in 1862 and operated by the Confederate forces. This ship replaced wooden ships due to its ability to withstand heavy fire. Because of its massive weight and the powerful currents of the Savannah River, the ship became impossible to navigate. Thus, it was used as a floating battery. With the outbreak of the Civil War in America, Confederate forces utilized this boat by scuttling it along the Savannah River in an attempt to avert the movement of Union forces into Savannah. Since then, the ship has remained submerged for more than a century until certain parts were recovered in 1986. Advancements in novel sonar technologies assisted the archaeologists in obtaining a clear picture of the site's topography. They have used single and multi-beam sonars, along with novel computer models, to map the wreckage. During the efforts of the U.S. Army Corps to deepen the Savannah River, the wreckage site was at risk. Due to its high historical value, the site was handed over to the archaeologists for excavation, making it the largest archaeological site in the entire U.S. The close proximity of the site to a busy container port made recovery missions more challenging. Underwater archaeologists and Navy divers dove to the bottom of the Savannah River to identify wreckage. Due to these intricacies, divers were tracked by high-tech tracking systems such as the Ultra Short Baseline Diver Tracking System or the USBL system. The positions received from the USBL transponders of the divers were correlated with the geographic information system data of the site to increase their navigation efficiency. The identified parts of the ship were strapped to a crane on a barge. A few cannons were identified and recovered during the early recovery missions.
The largest parts recovered were the casemates of the ship, which were the armored structures that protected the ship from enemy fire. Nearly 30,000 parts were recovered during the entire mission. Among them, around 13,000 parts were sent to a conservation research laboratory for conservation, and the non-conservable parts were reburied in the Savannah River itself. While these recovery missions create a tangible connection to the past, they also leave room to expand impacted natural resources as crucial arteries in the economy. Big one. On the other hand, salvage and recovery missions may stand as the last resort for unfolding the mysteries of air crashes. In achieving these goals, the unsurpassed accuracy and efficiency offered by state-of-the-art acoustic and imaging equipment are truly commendable. Salvage operations don't just occur under the water. The U.S. military must be ready at any time to recover damaged or crashed aircraft from airfields. That's where the crashed, damaged, and disabled aircraft recovery teams come in. The SEDAR system manages the recovery and speedy return to action of damaged or immobilized aircraft on the battlefield. This unique work necessitates expert individuals, extensive procedures, and sophisticated equipment. CDAR teams frequently work under challenging situations. They are critical to maintaining a military air campaign's operating tempo. CDAR towing operations entail a variety of platforms, each with its own set of advantages and disadvantages. Towing is a mission-critical task from the front line to the Forward Operating Base, FOB. One method required is called frontline recovery. During base operations, SEDAR ground support equipment is used at an airbase. Tow tractors, tugs, and bar. Receiver systems transport damaged aircraft to hangars or repair locations. Then, there is external transport, which includes larger assets for hauling aircraft fuselages or major components. Specialized equipment aids recovery efforts in SEDAR operations. Crash bags, also known as lift bags, are extremely important. These 25-ton lifting inflatable equipment are used to elevate the wreckage securely while limiting further harm. Controllable air inlets enable precise, progressive lift, which reduces strain
Cranes, with their high-capacity winches, are critical heavy lifters in SEADAR. From sunken warships to crashed planes, salvage and recovery operations represent some of the most complex and high-stakes undertakings in both military and civilian sectors. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.